This episode of Chicago's Bravest Stories is brought to you by Jenico Roofing. You can find them on Facebook, J-E-N-I-C-O. Vince, who knows building construction and roofing? Firefighters do. And this company is firefighter owned and operated. So Jenico are specialized in residential roof tear-offs here in Chicago and the suburbs. They are licensed and insured. You can get a hold of our friend Jim at Jenico at 815-693-5665. Jenico. Welcome back to Chicago's Bravest Stories. We have the honor here of having the chief from Broadview, Chief Kenny. How are you? I'm wonderful. <laughs> thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. We appreciate uh, you making the time and coming in here. Yeah, uh, we got a lot to cover, so let's just dive into it. Um, kind of give us a little background of um, your uh, firefighting career. So I'll go f- as far back as my family owned a tavern, and my dad said, "Come, you come work for me for a couple years, and then I'll give you some money to go to school, and you can do what you want to do." So I stuck there for five years. Went to Western for a year prior to that, and was sent home. <laughs> so <laughs> when you don't want know what you want to do with your life, don't go away to school. <laughs> so what was, what was the name of the tavern? Um, Kenny's Tavern in oh, Countryside. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's still there. It's Is it awesome. Really? Mm-hmm. They had their 26th year. Yeah. They're still rolling. They're wow. great. Um, family owned still or no? Uh, no, we sold it to two guys, but they, I mean, they treat us like family still. Anything oh, really? that happens when my dad passed, they had his whole event there, you know, his, his after party, we called it. <laughs> 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 so, um, from the bar, um, just knew I wanted to be a firefighter and uh, a couple guys that hung out there that worked at Pleasant View and Lombard kind of pushed me into it. Um, went to paramedic school, Good Sam, uh, right away got a job. I went from LaGrange, bored with full arrest, to give me some action. And I had done my ride time at Broadview and they had great connections with people around there. So they put me over at Melrose Park and that so was you, my- You started your career as a paramedic? As a paramedic. Okay. For two years, I was in Melrose Park. And you kind of got a good following here of good Sam paramedics that have been on this show. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. There's uh, our last guest was a good Sam paramedic. I was one for, a, a, you know, five years. Um, you get, Melrose, you guys weren't in good Sam, right, Cor? No. No. Okay. No, we are though now, uh, where I'm at. Oh, there we go. There yeah. you go. It comes, comes full circle. Yeah. So I always, the funniest thing is, during my interview for the Good Sam Paramedic Program, I went into labor and had my kid three hours later at the same hospital. <laughs> no joke. I was like in fear of a hundred people, a hundred EMTs, like my water breaking and then being like, oh God. You know, like <laughs> right. These guys doing their, uh, their, their OB clinicals. Yeah, right. Right. I'm like, can we just interview me really quick? I'm done with my test. Oh my God. So yeah. you're pregnant throughout so I was most pregnant. of paramedics. No, 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 no. I, I went into labor during the test, had the baby. Oh, I could not believe I got in. I can't oh. believe they're like, we're going to take the pregnant one. So I got in and. Hey, I'm you not know. pregnant anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Got through that. Maybe they had a quota and yeah. you met the... <laughs> right. We, I have, we, we have to we have one pregnant, pregnant woman. woman. <laughs> well, How are we going to find it again? <laughs> Where are we going to find a pregnant woman? <laughs> right. Uh, um, what? So uh, at that point, Chief, you had been... Uh, you were pregnant with your first child? That was my last one. No, oh. Yeah, I'd already had the two kids before that. So that was my last one, Keely. And she ended up being very sick. The entire time I was in paramedic school, she was at Good Sam. Oh. Got hired at... Melrose, and she was still sick. That it was a rough couple. I think first two years of my career, as she was sick, and I was working at Melrose. And back then, it was tough. Like contract medics, I don't know what they're making these days. Um, well, whatever it is, is it not? It's, it's not never, enough. It's, it's not enough. never enough. It's not enough. Nope. So nope. for people who are listening who don't understand how the uh, being a contract medic or being a contract firefighter, basically whatever that municipality is paying to have that firefighter or paramedic there. Half goes to the the company that owns the contract, and half goes to the actual employee. It's roughly half, um, but you know, if you think about how much time, and even when you do overtime on the contract, that's not that's not a lot of money. It's right. it's pretty uh, it's pretty sad that these guys are working the exact same shift, doing the exact same runs as you know. Uh, uh, somebody who's hired on by a municipality and they're getting paid half of what everybody else is getting paid. Yeah. Full timer. Yeah. Most of us treat it as a stepping stone. It's, it's our experience time. And then we, then we move it, on. It definitely was that for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I was in the same area that you guys were in 
during that period of time. And for my like actual experience of being a paramedic, being out there in that division was amazing. I learned so much. I learned, I really, you know, learned how to be a paramedic from being out there. Yeah. We, we see it all because we had highways and rail railways and we had action. Yeah. Well, the first and only, um, um, uh, surgical crike was done out there. And, uh, I still shit my pants when I think about that run, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was that the cicadas were out and, uh, you know, we were in a car like off the highway and just covered in cicadas and trying to do this with all those cicadas running around. Oh my it God. was, yeah. I was like, could this get any worse? <laughs> you know, that was horrible. Very weird. Kind of background of this. But then you remember it. You know exactly oh, how many years. Oh, I, 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 I can picture it because walking up to the car with all the cicadas, I was like, do I really want to do this? this like, is, do this we is ha- the locust. Is it- they're, they're just sending. <laughs> this is what I got to do, huh? And then, you know, you, you, you could not catch a break on that run. You know, not only the cicadas, but then when you come to the realization that a surgical crike is actually indicated here, I was like, oh, my God. Oh. Yeah. But yeah, it's one of the few I can't times say actually I've ever done one. It, you know, and that, that was what was going through my mind is like, when am I ever going to get another chance to do this? You know, a lot of systems don't have it. Right. You know, I, I can't do it in the city. Um, but uh, it was after it was all done, I would look back on it with good thoughts that I was actually able to. And if if my, the guy that I worked with wasn't with me, and I'll I'll shout out to Damon Martin. I don't care. I he, love he, that guy. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I do. He was my partner then. Really? And we, yeah, they, I, me and him were on that run, and we kind of both looked at each other, like waiting for one other, you know, each other to grab the scalpel. And we did. There was a minute there where we were both like looking at each other, like, "Go ahead, pick it up. Let's go. We got to do it." <laughs> That's a guy who should be training every medic that comes along. Well, He's me and him both had, uh, we, we <laughs> both had a good uh, EMS coordinator when we were there. Um, when I started, um, Fred Jeffries. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, and, you know, Damon is a product of that. And, you know, Damon was is a very, very good medic. So me and him being partners, we had a great time. It was great work. And, you know, uh, some contracts don't have the relationships with these, uh, the municipality guys. But I was treated so good over there in Bellwood by those guys. Those guys are still some of my very good friends. And those guys just treated us with nothing but respect and, you know, kindness. So um, I so wish we didn't that- see that. Like, see, I was the same way as a contract medic in Melrose. I was spoiled rotten. They knew my kid was sick. You know, everyone always talks about the expensive Melrose meals. There were times that the guys were like, no, Tracy's going through a hard time. Cover her. And I mean, I had a great I had a great partner. Skip Johnson, God rest his soul. He, uh, I won't forget, he he wore a toupee. (laughs) And I did not know this. And this man gets in the ambulance with me in the middle of the night and scared the crap out of me. Um, Was it attached to his baseball cap? Yep. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) It flipped it right on. (laughs) So he was, he's just one of those guys, same thing. I had good experience. He pushed me. And the one thing he said that always has stuck with me, and I say the same thing to people I teach is, you know, they're dead. You can only make it better, you know, in a situation of full rest. So it stuck, stuck with me. <laughs> so you got, you, you, uh, go to Melrose on the contract. Yep. And at what point do you make the transition into firefighting? So I was testing those two years. So I was in a couple lists. I honestly, uh, I always want to go to Broadview. That I was, mean, that was your that number was one. It. So I okay. did my ride time there at the time I lived there. I live there now again. But um, I knew that's where I wanted to be. Um, they had such a great reputation. I mean, I wanted that, you know. I wanted to get my butt kicked. I wanted to see fire regularly. And, you know, that was it for me. So that test, like, I had a couple lists that I was on. Um, they were the first to call me. So that was exciting So for that me. everything worked out, huh? It. <laughs> you wanted them? They were the first um, to call you? <laughs> kind of worked out. <laughs> worked out for about two, three years. And well, then, we'll get, we'll get into that. Yeah. We'll get into that. <laughs> Uh, so you, you get to Broadview and tell us about your first fire that you went to. First day. First day. First day. I didn't even have gloves yet. (laughs) So they were still looking for gloves for me. It was at 14th and Madison. I will not forget this. It was in Maywood. Um, and as we're going there, I mean, you could. Maywood's good for a fire too. Especially back then, right? Yeah. Oh. Back then it was. People laugh. Like I, 
I said, I, I think I, we counted it last year. It was over 30 fires I had my first year. Not, you know, that's, that's so rare. Pretty, yeah, it's pretty in the suburbs, you know? Open. And that wasn't including garages and dumpsters. That was house fires. <laughs> so, um, and being your first day and having a fire, I remember going there and this, the guy next to me said, oh, don't worry. You're not, you're not going in. You're, you're too new. And we get there and I had an awesome and very aggressive deputy chief at the time, um, Jack Kowalski. And he's like, oh, yes, she is. Somebody get her gloves. But first, you know, go hit the hydrant. And this guy, Paul Bojan, who's in the city now, he was the engineer. I ran down, got the hydrant because that's all I could do in Melrose. So I was pretty good at that. Right. He, then I'm headed back. He said, go get a pike pole. I mean, I'm telling you, I knew nothing about the fire service. and Still throws, gloveless at this point? I, I was like, <laughs> what is a pike pole and where is it located? It, it's so embarrassing. They shoved me in an attic and I was up in an attic for like 40 minutes uh, with a line. And it, it was the greatest wow. thing ever. You were hooked, huh? I was hooked. And my gloves were oh, like two times. There you go. Oh, that was so good. <laughs> and my gloves were like twice the size of my hand. Nothing fit. Even when I went to the academy, like... We were a, a huge department, a great department, but money was still lacking. Did you go to Arlington Heights? Uh, no, I ended up going to Oak Lawn. Okay. So, um, and I had really bad gear, got pretty burned and the fire academy, second degree burns across my back. Ugh. Didn't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> um, so yeah, I had a, I had a great experience there too. Oak Lawn was, you know, well known at the time and amazing. Wow. So yeah, good experiences all the way. So at that time, had you been through the academy yet, Chief? Or? At um, on your the, first fire. On your first fire. No, no, oh, I really? hadn't seen. I like I said, what's a pike ball? Because I didn't know <laughs> yeah, anything. Yeah, you know, thank God my dad had taught me about tools. You know, at least I had that. You know, my. <laughs> so you got hired, there. and they brought. You, was it supposed to be more like a ride time, uh, like an observation day? E yeah, I had a week of. No, I think I had, I'm sorry, like a month of days. And it just so happened that first day there was something there. Like, yeah. come on, you're going. This is literally taught me all the way through the day. I mean, it was a fire. It was a long fire. I remember that, you know, taught me how to pull ceiling. And I, I think I had something like eight fires before I went to the academy. <laughs> so I had started July 21st and I went to the academy in October. So you were salty walking in, huh? Well, and we, our tower burned all the time. Hence yeah. why it's not burnable anymore because <laughs> it just, it's disintegrated. No, it's, uh, it, they just gave me so much experience before I left. I mean, Jack Kowalski, Tom Gardner, it was guys like that, that, you know, they were, they pushed you. Yeah. So never. Tr and I, I, I always say this. Picked me out of crowd always to make me tougher, not to make me feel like I'm being singled out as a girl. They were just, you know, it was pretty much, and it was said to me several times, I'm doing this because I don't want you to embarrass me. Mm. My captain too, Ned Tome at the time, who's my deputy chief now, same thing. He'd, he'd shove appliances. What's this? What's this? And yeah, he was the captain when I was out there. Oh yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm happy to have him as my deputy chief now. Wow. Well, so. um, you, so you go to the academy, you've already have <laughs> roughly eight fires under your belt uh, before even stepping in the academy, which I think is awesome. Um, working, working nine to five. Right, yeah. right. Well, on, on top of it. Yeah, you don't do yeah. overnights. Oh, yeah. Yeah. These are we, during the day for house fires. Yeah. If we had callbacks, I'd go flying back there and hoping to catch the deputy when he came in to switch cars and hop in with him. Did you guys have pagers for? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All oh, the good old days. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good old days. Uh, so you, you finished the academy and you come back to Broadview as a firefighter and how many years, well, I know that we're going to get into that, but, um, kind of walk us through that, that your first, you know, your introduction to being the new guy at, at Broadview. Um, you were taking it pretty well. Yeah. Because I had done my ride time there. I had a relationship with a lot of people, you know, and I, my family still owned the tavern. So I was bringing meals during my ride time. I <laughs> earned everybody's trust. I was baking my cakes, my Portillo's cakes. You know, I, I Ooh. gained some, you know, there was a comfort level for me when I got there. You were making um, Portillo's cake. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of mayo, right? Yeah, yes. 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 God damn right. And there's the, no better way to get, get out okay with, with the fireman in your exactly. town by your family owning a tavern. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Right. That kind of helped. <laughs> for two years into my job, they did. And then we oh. sold it. But yeah, it was, it was a great, I mean, I look back at my first year and I, the people I had around me was the most important part. You know, I had guys that at the time, uh, We'll get into it later about the layoffs, but these were guys that like, I was having trouble with the saw. They'd be out there at eight o'clock at night with me. This guy, Alex Silva, Pat Sperling, just these middlemen that were just, they went above and beyond to make sure I knew my job. And again, 
they'll always say, we're doing this because, you know, we need you to be good. You can't be that girl. And at the time we had three other females, two had left at, at Broadview, at Broadview. Um, two had left to go to other jobs. And then uh, Kelly had been there probably eight years, nine years prior to me. And she just retired last year. So um, there was just two of us for a very long time, but uh, yeah, um, they, we always were in the tower. It was a regular thing in the tower. That was like an every Friday thing. I told my guys yesterday, cause we're, we had a fire and we're kind of talking about it and how to educate ourselves to do better next time. And uh, I said, I can remember coming to work. And if you couldn't find the deputy and Captain Gardner wasn't around and that was the shift. Oh God, you were in trouble. Cause you knew something was happening. Like if you had a big breakfast, go get sick. Cause you're going <laughs> to get sick later. I mean, I mean, to the point of most fires, I mean, that they would do in the tower. Like it was so hot. You're coming out puking and then going back in. So, so was, when you're talking about the tower for other people, you're talking about the sorry. training tower. Yeah. We had a training where you could actually, set, you know, like, uh, you know, like burn stuff and mm -hmm. really smoke them out and feel some heat in there. And, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> yeah, climb some stairs, you know, climb some ladders. You could do everything in that tower. Yeah. And until it spalled, you know, over years, it was finally going to, you know, well, you definitely got your money's worth out of that tower. Absolutely. Well, I personally did. Yes. And now, <laughs> now we've changed it up a little bit. The top floor is like a maze. Now we have uh, doors. Um, it, we've got a lot of props in there now to yeah. make it and smoke it up, but it's not like it used to be. That heat, you just, you can't replicate that kind of stuff. <laughs> you can't. When you have tree, we would take Christmas trees and burn them. And one of the guys was coming up the stairs with a Christmas tree and it took off in the stairwell, you know, and. <laughs> He comes around the corner and it's on fire and he's throwing it onto the bed. It was like, all right, so it's really hot in here. I mean, I get it. I yeah. get it, man. So, I mean, that kind of heat made doing the job a lot easier because your expectations are, this is going to be tough, you know? And I just, I, I was very blessed to have the mentors. And I say mentors because, you know, not a, and I don't mean to point out the girl, go girl thing, but sometimes it's really hard to find a guy that will take the time with a girl. He make the effort. And, Every single guy there did. I, I was never treated any different than anybody. Everyone made time for me and made sure I was good at the job. Well, especially, you know, back in that day, that, that wasn't the typical culture for women in the fire service. Nope. Right? So your experience, as awesome as it was, was not the experience that other women were experiencing across the country. Nope. Right. And, and then, I knew I mean, that. Did you get, were you getting feedback about like how other females were treated in other departments? Uh, yes. You know, I, I, when I was laid off, I did some work and I, I had some not so great experiences that I regret that I didn't deal with them back then. I just left the job rather than dealing with them. Um, I have a lot of regrets as a female chief now of not fixing things, but now I can and now I will. And if I ever heard something like that again, I would go out of my way. But yeah, it was, it was a pretty common thing. It wasn't like, you know, sexual, my first day of Melrose Park, it was a sexual harassment class. It was like, oh, really? <laughs> like, I have to sit through this? Uh. So, I mean, that's when it was first being introduced that this was wrong, you know? And to be honest with you, being raised in a bar, you know, I had a pretty bad mouth and a you had different your, you kind had of thicker attitude. skin. Yeah. Like, inherently, yeah. I had guys as friends, you know, and I was one of those people that shot her mouth off and swore a lot and drank and, you yeah. know, I was Wasn't one of those. scared to let people know what was no, on your mind. Right. Yeah. So I, I stood up for myself. I was, but there was a lot of women that wouldn't just because, you know, they didn't want to compromise the job. And it, that's just rough. I hate that that happened to anybody. So would, would you say, I mean, you'd be a pretty good gauge on this. Um, were we vastly better now as a, a profession? Yes. Yeah. I can say, in my experience, in my division, and what I see in classes and going to the National Fire Academy, I can see how it's become a level playing field. It's still awkward being only one of two female chiefs in Illinois because sometimes I feel like I'm asked to do things because I'm a girl and they need that diversity. Right. But then I look at it a different way, like this is a huge opportunity to make some changes, get in there and do that. You know, do you, take do you have any idea how many female well, chiefs across the country? Uh, we make up, I think as of this year, 72 and it only makes up less than one percent of the population of fire chiefs that's great yeah wow. mm -hmm. well we are glad to have i mean 
the one percenter sitting here with us, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Used to be a bad thing. Now it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's and that's a, that's that's phenomenal that the Broadview guys were like that. But that you know that's I think almost taken away a little bit from you is that like I'm sure you proved to those guys coming in like they weren't just accepting off the bat to you. You know, I'm sure yeah. that that you kind of had to kind of earn your way and prove that you were worth that type of time. And it's a, a true testament to you, chief. I think uh, two back surgeries and two shoulder surgeries, you know, it's that I got it. I got it. I don't need anybody's help, you right. know, and now I'm feeling it. <laughs> so if there's anything I could teach women now, it's take the help, you know, still you can earn the respect, but take the help. You don't have to carry that on your own. Right. Well, I mean, that part of the culture, I don't think we got to, you know, it, it's still like, go do your job. Don't let anybody take, you know, uh, your equipment. Don't let anybody do your job. That's never going to change, you yeah. know, but when you know you're over your head, then I, I, I can see asking for help. But yeah. uh, it, that's, that's going to be a tougher change than changing the culture of females in the fire service. Agreed. You know, I yeah. absolutely agree with that. Yeah. And, and, and to, to some extent, line. it probably shouldn't, you know. Yeah, to, it's, to, to it's some, that pride and ownership yes. of I can do this and yes. look what I can do. And right. yeah, we're going to beat our bodies up. It's yeah. just part of the job. Right. Yeah. And there's definitely a fine line between like owning your shit yes. and becoming a liability right. to four other guys. And then so. and, and just being ridiculous, like you're not going to lift that guy yourself. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're, yeah. You're not going to lift that guy. That guy is not moving yes. without some help. But show me the best way to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And when I figure that out, I'll let you know too. <laughs> we want to thank our sponsor, Bender Lift. Bender Lift is a patient lift device that buckles handles around the patient's torso so, so firefighters can safely lift patients of any size with ease. The most injury prone non fire ground activity a firefighter does is lift a patient. If you're lifting heavy patients, and let's be honest, all of us are then you're going to want to check out the Bender Lift so you can avoid getting injured from lifting a patient. Vince, have you ever lifted up a heavy patient or any patient at all? Um, I've blown my back out so many times lifting heavy patients. I can't count the number of times. So something like Bender Lift is a pretty awesome product, especially if it's going to save me from uh, having to lay up from the job or go to medical or just work the rest of my day in pain. Absolutely, and they'll, they'll let anyone try it out for free. Doesn't matter what your role is within the department. Just sign up for a free field trial on their website, and they'll send you a set of bender lifts to try out for a month or so, absolutely free. We use them in our department, and I recommend you give them a try. Just Google bender lift to watch some videos and sign up for a free trial. Bender lift, they, the new slogan should be bender lift, save your back. <laughs> save your back. So you want, so we're, we're early in your career now and, and you know, uh, there's some people out there who are listening that understand the history of Broadview that what that department went through. Um, how long were you on there before the layoffs happened? I was on for three years. Okay. So that that's relatively early. Yes. That's, that's real early in your career. Yes. So how, like walk us through how that went down. Did you, did you walk in the work one day and they were like, Hey, pack your stuff or did you get a lot? Did they call you? How, how'd that go down? Yeah. So we heard rumors. Yeah. We heard that things weren't very good in the village. And let me back all this up by saying, uh, you know, chief Tierney took it pretty hard that he was going to have to let people go. And, and it, people don't see that that was something he inherited, you know, that he had to deal with. So I think he got a bad rap during that time. And it, that really bummed me out, you know, because in the long run, he was a tough chief and he toughened me up. But same thing with the village, you know, it was a financial, obviously a financial issue. And I, I don't know enough about it to speak on that side of it. I just know that their easiest way of dealing with it was let's get rid of everybody. I don't remember hearing, well, everybody take a pay cut. Will everybody do something different? We were never given an opportunity. So one day I, I was offered a job in Forest Park and I went into the chief's office. This was prior to layoffs and like the week before we got our letters. And I said, I've been offered a job at Forest Park. And he said, you know, don't, don't go. This is just rumors right now. Don't worry about it. And you, and up until this point, you, people had started hearing the rumors uh -huh. and stuff like, because it started to look really bad. Yeah. Um, 
and it you know eventually would be bad. But you got a letter, a letter from the department or the city. Uh, we got a letter from the the village through the, the the chief had it handed to us each individually. Oh, so that you could they couldn't say that you never received it. Yep. Okay. So they hand it to us each individually, and it was like your last day is. And to be honest with you, it's. I don't mean to shirk it like it didn't happen, but it's such a past now that I don't remember those little details. But I remember the morning leaving and being ever that it was a last shift for everybody who was on. And I was on the night before and I had to leave with a shirt on that said no, no joke because we had to hand everything back in. It was a shirt someone gave me. I, I would never take home. It said, we'll fight fire for sex. It was so embarrassing. It was the only <laughs> shirt I had. <laughs> That's that's what it, you love. It's so embarrassing. Right. So I had this shirt on and I turned it inside out because I was like, Vince I am is not actually wearing, wearing that shirt. Yeah, right right now. <laughs> I got to change. There you go. I'm like, I am not wearing this out. So oh, I God. flipped it around and there actually were was press there. And oh, I was like, oh, thank God, God I did geez. that. So just, you know, thanks for not making me. So suck how, at this job. What, what was yeah. the percentage that they let go? Yeah. It yeah. was so we were. We were. 12 guys a shift, nine man minimum. And they let two had left. So there was already two gone, another 12. So 14 total. 14. So we actually went down to four man shifts. But, or, I'm sorry, four man minimum, six guys on a shift. No ambulance? Uh, yeah, we were a jump company. Okay, so. You, In a, a town a, with a that kind of fire. A four man shift with two people on the ambulance. So you're running with an engine with an officer and an engineer. Mm -hmm. And we still, I think for like another month, had the contracts at Loyal and Hines. So we're still running ambulance calls yeah. in a Loyal and Hines. Well, I, I remember those days yeah. because we would go. You were picking up the slack. You were picking up the slack. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, your engine would show up on these medical runs. And it, it's and I was like, there's only two people here. You know, I, I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't that informed about what was going on until much later. Um but, uh, yeah, I was like, you know, there's two people. Like, what What do you guys – so what did they do if they had a fire? What did that engine do? Well, I mean, the engineer's not going anywhere. No, right? lieutenants ended up being engineers, uh, captains would be on it, and then the two guys from the ambulance would actually bring the ambulance there and jump, and then I've got an ambulance and that's call. if they weren't on a run. Yeah. And if they exactly. were on a run, you got, you got two guys, two guys showing up. And, and, you know, fast forward to my first day back, we were still at that. Yeah. I had a guy retire. That's why I ended up going back. We had our, my first day. It was Thanksgiving Eve. Did they take you back at seniority? Yeah, they did. They, I okay. got all my time back. I Sadly, I had pulled my pension because I had a sick kid at the time. Oh, yeah. So I had pulled my pension, which is, I could retire in four years, but I've got seven now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, it could have been 10, yeah. you know, could because like, there were guys who, who got laid off that had a lot of time on mm -hmm. and they were beyond the age to test with other departments, right? No, it, it was considered um, lateral. A right. couple of them, I, I'll be honest with you, most got really good jobs and did very well. Um, a lot of us struggled. I worked, um, I was in a couple lists, so I was kind of waiting, but I worked three jobs, uh, three part-time jobs just to make it happen. Thank God for PSI. They called me and said, you know, we heard uh, when you stay devoted to your contract, you know, and they heard it happen. Trace will take you and find three other guys that need a job there. And I did. So, oh. yeah, only two of us ended up going back out of all those laid off. Really? Only two of us did. Mm -hmm. So everybody else got taken care of, moved on to greener pastures. And greener pastures, some different job fields. Yeah. You know, I keep in touch with every single guy. So That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That so, will never change. So they bring you back. Um, you're You're still working, like below minimum standards. Mm -hmm. And where do we go from there? Did you, how long before you took a promotion? So, uh, well, like I said, my first day back and experiencing only four guys on an engine scared the crap out of me. I'm like, this is how things go now. Right. You know, uh, how are we safe? And how long were you gone at that point? Uh, two, 18 months. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Was there any retraining involved in coming back or it was just like, Pick up where you left off. I think it was a matter of desperation and, you know, just get back to what you were doing yeah. and prove yourself. And it, and with that many, that volume of call, we used to run two ambulances. Now we have one. Try fitting the training in, you know, but they still did. I'll tell you, Jeopardy Chief Kowalski, you know, he, he made things happen. And then at the time, uh, Gardner, it was talk that Tyranny was leaving and 
when Gartner became chief is when things started to change. He like redefined um, the entire department. He ended up doing like one acting lieutenant, or I'm sorry, one floating lieutenant. That way we had more engineers and more medics and we could trade off some more. So it wasn't the same two guys all the time being on the ambulance. And forgive me when I say guys, it's just a general term. <laughs> um, so it, it was. It, it means was, a lot more when you say it than yeah, when right, we say it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so things changed, changed a lot when he became chief. Um, he got the safer grant and we brought three guys on. Uh, with when I became deputy, he and I were able to get back our contracts, which helped us hire more people. So now we're at a six man minimum um, with eight guys. And you, you, this, you guys are a union department, right? Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine what that fight must have been when they wanted to start laying you guys off. It was like, awful. It, I mean, a drag out fist fight with the with the village and the union. It, it, it had to be right. You know. It was a different union at the time. Uh, they, they have switched unions since, which was a good job. And I won't, the people that stood up for us at the time that were our union reps went above and beyond again. Um, every board meeting was packed. It was, it was a really rough time. Uh, it, it's, I hope that people saw the devastation it caused and won't go there. I've seen it happen other places, but not to our volume. And the best part is this mayor that we have now is, outstanding. She's like, that's never going to happen again. And if we have to take pay cuts together, we'll take pay cuts together, but I'm not going to let that happen. So you just have to have the right people and transparency in the government to, to see. I mean, if there's not enough money, for, I, my big goal this year was to hire three more. I wanted a seven man minimum because I, I think that we'd be most efficient with a second ambulance to make that happen in a three man engine. Um, unless we have a fire and someone's out, then we change things up. But um, she was on board and then coronavirus, <laughs> you know, and, and she's very straight up. Tracy, I wanted that to happen. I'm sorry it can't, but we'll, we'll work on that for the future, you know. And Well, your she, ambulance is a good source of revenue. Absolutely. Yeah, and now that so. we're going to, you know, once we got those contracts back, it, Chief Gardner left before he saw that to fruition. Um, we did... Um, he just retired and we finally got the contract with uh, Heinz back. And that was great, but it is, uh, Heinz is a changing place too. You know, it used to be, you know, just veterans and now they're having, you know, they have homes there now and it's non-veterans and it, I don't want to take away from mm. my own village. So we're trying to work all those things out, but you guys know the ambulance volume is just skyrocket and take coronavirus away. Right. You know, we, and I hate to say this, we, you know, Fire is not what it used to be. It's more EMS, especially by me. And the volume of EMS calls is just soared. Was everybody, when you came on, uh, was being a paramedic a requirement? Of, yes. Yeah? Yes. So you had to be a paramedic, still is. Okay. Um, this, and I'll tell you, as chiefs, we've all talked, especially uh, Metro chiefs that we've recently had a meeting, guys are saying that guys have choices now. So our lists are smaller. Less people taking. Uh, the paramedic uh, classes and exams. So last year, there should have been about 110 in our area that graduated from paramedic schools, uh, 47. So that pool just keeps diminishing. And I don't know what it is because this is the greatest job <laughs> in the world. I don't, it, I mean, if you have a passion for fire, in, in the beginning, we all said, oh, we have to be paramedics to be firemen. And yeah, that sucks. But your every day is so amazing because you're doing different things. Like I love that about Broadview. One day I'm on the engine. Next day I'm, on the, I'm driving the truck. Next day I'm on the squad. Next day, you know, I'm in the ambulance. Like that was the greatest thing ever. Now, yeah, it's just two vehicles going out, but it's still exciting. Every day is different. Well, I know that you, um, you wanted to get into talking a little bit about uh, mental health. When did you... At what point in your career did you start really advocating for mental health as far as it related to first responders? I think about four years ago, we saw such an increase in suicides among not just uh, firefighters, paramedics, but police as well. It was more of a public safety thing, passion have, for me. We, we did have a, a big surge in that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we've we've talked about that in other podcasts that we don't know why and we, especially, you know, for us in the city, we, we had a big surge of them and nobody can figure out why. And I'm not ashamed to say this. And I say this out loud. Anytime anyone asks, I went through a really hard time and 
was in a really bad place. And thank God I had somebody who said, you need to go get some help. And they, Sarah Gurra's, Gurra's office, and I, I hate to advocate for one place, but I just found somebody there that was wonderful. It wasn't Sarah, but somebody in that office and started going. And, and this is like something that I've seen. And I'll tell you what I see in firemen, especially in paramedics. Taking care of other people takes away having to deal with our own shit. And if I can go and, you know, there's a full arrest, the guy comes back, I save somebody, but screw myself. You know, it's, it's almost like feeding the soul by caring for other people when you're so messed up. So I learned all about that through this EMDR that I went through. Um, don't ask what it stands for. That's <laughs> eye movement, desensitization, something. Um, but it was a really, sorry, it was a really good experience for me to go through that and then come back and say, we had a benevolent fund in the division that I had started and the money was just sitting there. Cause you know, everyone says, Hey, not everyone, but when someone's truly sick and needs money, you know, I have cancer, we can speak about it. We can speak out loud about it. So that's what that was for to give people money to help them. But that wasn't hard because everyone's willing to say, you know, something's wrong and I'm physically with me and people will help, but no one's saying there's something mentally wrong with me because there's such a stigma of, well, then you can't do the job. You're so messed up, you know? So I transitioned this money from the benevolent fund with the agreement of all the chiefs in the division um, and turned it into a mental health fund. So now anybody in division 20 can go to this um, office that we use. And as long as they're on a roster from their department, division 20, um, we pay for the first three appointments. And then after that, they teach them how to use their um, insurance or self-pay or even go through their, um, and I'm blanking on it. What do we have within our workplace? Um, oh, uh, <coughs> uh, you talking about like an EAP? Yeah, yes, EAP thank there. you. Or she teaches you how to work with your EAP. So every guy gets three appointments. Now, if he stops there, he stops there. But at least I know I did something to get that guy there and it's being used it increased even over this time of coronavirus um and i push people into it and i get updated rosters from chiefs so they know it's that important how can but, uh if anybody says how can they get to this program uh, through the division we so we put something out with all the chiefs and they've okay. posted it so all the chiefs in the division and it's just for your division mm -hmm. division 20 mm -hmm. and it, everybody has access to it right now yep. so we don't really have to um, really push that for you right now. No, they, they have all that. They information. have everything they need. Now, and when when somebody, let's go back to you. So, when you were going through your hard time, mm -hmm. what what cues did you have that you, you know, or maybe you didn't know at the time, but somebody else noticed that pushed you to get help? Like, what was going on with you? Like, explain. Like, what were the signs and symptoms that you had that you know you look back now and been like, oh, I had a problem obsessing on work to avoid going home, to avoid dealing with things at home. Like if, if I went to work for 12 hours a day, then I could just go home and go to bed. And then I stopped going out. I stopped hanging out with friends. I just kind of. Self-isolated sort of thing. It, yes. And then, uh, then on the other extreme, you know, I would, you know, if I would go out, I would have a little too much to forget. You know, it was just part of what I was doing. It was a horrible cycle. And I knew it. I'd seen enough of it, you know, and I talked you knew to what, other when, people. When you were going through it, you knew it, but you couldn't get out of it. Yeah, no. And and that's the hardest part. That's got to be hard. And, it, and there's something incredibly ironic, and, and pardon the terminology, but insane, that our inherently wacky job that we have, mm -hmm. we somehow find comfort in okay, well, at least I know what it's going to be like at the yeah. firehouse today. At least I know, like, and, and it's, it's a banana's job. Every day is different, but you still feel more comfortable there than you do in your own skin sometimes. It's, yeah. it's crazy. It's a crazy idea. And, and the thought process of that is, is some of these guys are just as messed up as me. So it's a right. comforting thing, you know, like, right. I, I think we've all said it, you know, you're not totally sane if you're doing our job because we see a lot of, and someone said to me, was it, what you see on the job, what is it, is it what you do on the job that, you know, that made this happen? And no, for me, it was my past as a child and, and growing up that, that made, you know, that, that was the reason why I was falling apart at this time. It was like new triggers that caused it. 
So it wasn't anything really that I'd seen her done as a firefighter, but we do become. It didn't help. No, no. But you get into that job again because avoiding taking care of yourself and taking care of others. I'm sure nurses do it. I'm sure doctors do it. Police officers. It's if you can take care of somebody else, you never have to focus on you. So that makes sense. Yeah, it was. That was a. That was my thing. That's what I always did, and it's why I got on the job. Well, you know, you were talking about. Um, you know, you're constantly taking care of people. So, you know, your house is a mess. And, you know, I could make the analogy that, you know, a mechanic has a terrible car. Right. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know, well, uh, with, with uh, that thing, the shoemaker yeah. shoes. Yeah. Or yeah. Whatever. The, you know, the four star chef goes home and he has a TV dinner. You know, you're dead <laughs> on. You are dead on. You know, That's the just maid it. has her house looks terrible, mm-hmm. stuff everywhere. And so, you know, you can kind of extrapolate that to what we do and here we are, you know, but it doesn't, you got to the point where you got the help that you need, but it sounds like you put up a fight though, right? Uh, Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The the blessing of going through this and I, for two years I went just to, to, and it's not to say that there's present day triggers where I got to go back and have a talk, you know, and you know, People give me advice all the time. Why don't you give her a call and play catch up, you know, bring someone. But I see it now in other people more than I did in myself. So now I feel like I have a responsibility. Do you, do you speak up? Do you oh, absolutely. approach them? I, I tell people any, the fact that I'm saying it right now, there's a lot of people who are going to listen to this, I hope. And I'm not ashamed to say I got help. I'm not ashamed to say I went through a really shitty time. And I found help and I got better and I'm better today because of it. I mean, I honestly would not have taken my department to where it's at right now. if I didn't get help. I would have, I can't, I getting help saved my life. And I hope that it is now in this position and having experienced it, I'm an advocate. I have to look out for people. That's why I switched this benevolent fund into mental health fund. And I will, I'll, People can call me, people can, anything they need. Chiefs, if they want to find out how to create this fund within their own divisions, I'm more than willing to show them how I did it. Well, we have, uh, ironically enough, um, we just signed on uh, a Fire and Iron, uh, with Fire and Iron Media, uh, Dr. Cody Todd, who's a psychologist, and she's going to be doing a podcast here with us, and it's about first responders' mental health. Excellent. as well. So we, um, we kind of sought her out. We thought the work that she's doing and the subject matter was important that we kind of took it on ourselves. We, we actively sought her out and, um, signed her on here. So that's coming soon. Awesome. Um, so that, that'd be something to look forward to. And, you know, if we can offer any help there, you know, with you guys, we'd be more than happy to. And, um, you know, we can, you know, definitely go down that road together and whatever projects you want help with, we can definitely, you know, we'll be there for you. That's great. Um, yeah. With the, uh, uh, with the mental health fund or benevolent fund or, mm-hmm. um, you still doing, uh, active fund. I mean, I think everything's kind of on hold, but are we still doing active fundraisers this year for any of that? Or is that no, not-, not right now. Well, I'll be honest with you. There's just money sitting there, you know, and it, people weren't using it. So now it's getting used. And I think I'll jump back into stuff next year. Um, and, and start revving it up again. I, I want to give, no joke, like coronavirus a year. Like I say next March, I'll start doing stuff. It just seems like anything I've done in the village has been put on hold. So this is too. Is there any other um, health and wellness stuff that you've gotten into? Uh, is, so I, I'm currently going to school and I got a f- um, scholarship this past year from Illinois Fire Chiefs from the REACT Foundation, the Ryan Elwood Foundation. So I'm currently personally raising money for that foundation. Um, Because they just put something out. Well, tell us about that one. So the Ryan Elwood Foundation, uh, Ryan uh, uh, took his own life. It's like, you always want to find the right word to say that. Like commit a suicide just sounds so rough. Aggressive, yeah. Yeah, but it's the truth, you know, and his family have gone, you know, above and beyond to find a way to help people. And uh, getting that scholarship was ironic for me because it was right at the time that I was ending my the help that I was getting. So the fact that I got that scholarship from them, I'm like, oh yeah, this is a sign that I need to keep pushing through with all this with my own guys and my own division. So I am saying if anyone's looking for a foundation to donate to right now, um, they have a big thing going on right now. 
looking for donations. So it's REACT. Um, and again, I hate acronyms. That's just, <laughs> That's okay. I'm yeah, not we'll, going to get it all out we'll, there. Uh, we'll, we'll put that up for Perfect. you. Perfect. Uh, Thank you. On our uh, Chicago's Bravest Stories podcast website, uh, we have a bunch of uh, donations yeah, donation and charities. Pages. Perfect. So we'll, we'll include that in there. Perfect. Um, so you kind of got the scholarship right when, I mean, for lack of a better term, when you were all better, when yeah, you, when yeah. you felt that you were healed, moving on, moving yeah. on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and it, where are you in your career at this time? So I, no joke on Monday is I start my six year as a chief. That's just so weird to me. <laughs> I, I mean, I remember going, no one's going to do 12 years as a chief. I'm not going to, now I have like only seven years left, you yeah. know? So, um, I honestly, this has been the greatest job these past three years because of the support I have in the village and the mayor and the chief of police and all the leadership in my village is amazing. And I am better at my job because of this female um, mayor that we have. She just kind of pushed me to do more than I ever thought I could or would do. So I started a camp three years ago um, when you heard hashtag uh, we can't or hashtag me too. I was trying to find a spin on that instead of girls saying, poor me. And, and don't get me wrong. It's out there and it's horrible, but I wanted to find another way to approach it. Right. So I created this camp called Camp We Can Too, hashtag We Can Too. And I brought women from top 10 jobs where male, um, it was male dominated. And they came in and spoke to all these girls. So this was going to be my third year for camp. And I was so excited, but wow. we had to cancel it. But she pushed me to doing stuff like that. And, you know, I do a lot of, Things within our village. Um, I do a lot of events in the firehouse and it's just kind of opening our doors. The communities were so close. It's, and it's because of her and she's how she pushes everybody in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> well, her, you know, definitely her and you chief. I mean, there's after, after all the problems of the Broadview fire department has been through, I mean, for them to come out of this, not having a bad attitude for your guys being honestly from, from the guys that I know the more progressive guys I've ever met, you know, like very, just a very positive environment that you guys are running. I mean, that's, that's you. I mean, looking, looking at your kids, um, for them to actually seek out kind of a, a fairly, you know, fairly similar profession <laughs> as you, like it's, <laughs> You got a you got a great spin on things. It definitely seems like uh, seems like you're you're pushing out to other people too. Um, so with uh, I, as a segue, you feel like talking about the about the kiddos at all? Oh or? yeah, yeah. I mean the firehouse or my own kiddos? All right. I'm kidding, yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's start with your your birth kids. <laughs> I, I know you did, the you, one I had in labor. So we're blessed. She's here today. I did CPR on her twice. She should oh. not be here. So she's that kid. We all call her our old soul. She's going to school right now at ISU. She's uh, going to be a sophomore. Um, the kid who would never go to a sleepover can't wait to leave for college again. So <laughs> she got the bug. Um, she's amazing. She's going to be a teacher, but we have all said this kid should be a counselor. She's just this like calming, <laughs> awesome kid. Like she's here for a reason, you know? And then I have my daughter, Trisha. Um, she is a police officer, McCook. Um, from the day she saw Caps on TV. If, no joke, four years old, I'm going to be a cop, I'm going to be a cop, which turned into I'm going to be a police officer when she realized <laughs> cop didn't sound as nice. Um, oh, she's she's done such amazing things. I mean, she's five to 100 pounds soaking wet, but she is tough and mean. <laughs> and then my son, Casey, is an Air Force. We might Force. be talking to her in, a, in yeah. about 10 more years, too, when she's the chief of police officer. I hope so. I think she's got it in her. Yeah. Um, but then Casey, my son, he's in Arizona right now at uh, Davis Monthan. I always hope I say that right in Tucson, Arizona. And he's a firefighter in the Air Force, totally by accident. He was going in to be an electrician the day before he went to Mets. They said, you have to wait six more months. Uh, they, we don't have an electrician pos position open. He's like, oh, no, I quit my job. I'm ready to go. Give me something. They're like, well we do have it open as a firefighter. And he's like, oh, no way. And they're like, <laughs> why? It's the greatest thing ever. And he's like, I mean, my mom's a firefighter. Well, worse, my mom's a chief. And the guy's like, if you're going, you better not tell anybody that. <laughs> like, just go in there like you don't know anything about it. So he, he was finishing his medical um, in the Air Force and yep. they still hadn't uh, given him the spot he signed nope. up for? Nope. So nope. crazy. Yep. 
So then that, I think that's what they call the bait and switch, right? <laughs> right, probably. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, what a not a bad job to go into. No, I, it worked out in his yeah. favor. I'd rather do that than be an electrician, <laughs> you know. Well, he's uh his stepfather was Nothing an electrician and got him Corey. into it, right? Right? No, this one too. <laughs> I'm not a real one. <laughs> <laughs> not that uh, you know, I'm just real saying, yeah, in the air force, <laughs> the electricians, uh, you know. Yeah, so he's doing really well. He's he's he went to Kuwait. I have not seen him in over a year. It's been pretty hard. So oh, he's coming home in September. I cannot wait. It's I'm so excited. Is he um uh, not to not to get sidetracked? Does he think about signing a long term thing with the Air Force, or is he thinking? Yes, about, and oh, he's really? thinking about going into the electrician part of it. And oh, yeah. drop and being a firefighter. And he's like, Mom, it's, we just don't see the action you see. You know, on base, like sure, if a if, you know if a plane blows up, I'm busy, but how often does that really happen? Right. So, well, as an we'll electrician, see. you could work every single day. Yeah, you could I, do I, electrician I, stuff. Ironically, Vince has told me I should become an electrician before fireman. Also, <laughs> he's like, just, just dropped the whole fireman thing. It's not, it's not working for you. I told him. I told Corey he could be the lieutenant of electricians. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, and uh, and I guess looking back, also uh, trace anything. I mean, not to take away. I mean, any. Any messages you got for uh, for other women in the fire service that you'd like to get out there? You have to have thick skin. You do. I mean, uh, my dad, and I will not forget this, I remember my first day at Mauro's, and he was like, okay, you're not allowed to cry. You know, you're not allowed. You cook for these guys. Like, my dad was so old Yeah, but over there, they they let you cook? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> my dad's it, like, uh, that doesn't just happen so you over know, there. yeah. <laughs> exactly right he's like this is a men's club this is my dad's i'm not i'm gonna quote him this is a men's club and you're lucky they're letting you in and i was like okay and that's how i went into it it wasn't until i got to bravo and i was like men's club come on <laughs> you know let's change that up and you know i to me there's always going to be firehouse banter there's always going to be stuff that's going to make you uncomfortable as a female get up and walk out or take it on and challenge it, but be ready for the challenge. And it's not to say that any sort of harassment is acceptable. It never is. And, and I will stand my ground on that because never should a woman have to go through that. But, you know, sometimes we give it as much as we get it. And we need to check ourselves too. You know, sometimes we want to be like the guys and we say uncomfortable things. So check yourself, you know, and just work hard. I think that's why I'm where I'm at today. I don't think I know. I'm sorry. I don't think I'm not lucky. It didn't just happen. I worked my ass off and I, I was good at my job and I knew the administrative side of it and how to get grant money and make other things happen. And, and I'm very proud to be where I'm at and I have truly earned it and I'm excited to do it for seven more years and seven more years only. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it, this career, some people just screw it up and, and go into it with an, the whole plan of, you know, it's a great job. Do what you love doing and make the changes where you need to make them. Um, my new thing with my guys, every year I kind of change something up. This year it's don't bitch, do. <laughs> so if something doesn't work or something isn't the way you want it, I'd love to see the new SOP or directive and go ahead and fix it. Give me, don't walk in my office complaining. Walk right. in my office with, here's the problem and we're going to fix it together. Well, don't, uh, I always believe that uh, when I'm approaching, you know, people above me in the chain, I try to bring them solutions, not problems. Yeah. Right. And it, it seems to be working out. Yeah. And it's, 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 and that was given to me by somebody who I really look up to, really respect. And I gave it a try. I'm like, man, you know what? Like. You know, and now I get trusted with more stuff. And you're, yeah, and you're part of the change. Yeah. And now this is what I tell my officers. What is your legacy going to be? What are you going to leave when you retire? You know, I say it to the officers, but I would say it to anybody who's on the job. When you leave, don't be known as the guy in the recliner that everyone hated. Be the guy that, you know, it doesn't even have to be a save on a job. It can be that you helped get that new vehicle that now is going to last another 10, 20 years. And, you know, you're, that's your legacy. You be proud of your department and have some involvement in it. So I just wanted to get back because I think you have the opportunity to shed a little light on this. 
for somebody who's going through a hard time, but let's say, you know, let's use the example of me and Corey. I see Corey going through something and Corey's like really hard headed about getting help. Drinking like, heavily. Drinking heavily, doing podcasts all day. <laughs> um, what, like, what advice are you going to give to like the person like me who wants to talk to him, who wants to bring this out? Like what, What's the best course of action here? How do I help him without, you know, him getting pissed at me or, you know, me worrying about like, you know, he's just going to uh, go further in and uh, not deal with this. It's the level at which you approach somebody. So I never go to somebody and say, what the hell's wrong with you? I go to somebody and say, what happened to you? And I learned that no joke from, and it was an Oprah statement and it, truly opened my eyes. It was this, God, something happened to this person. They're not, they're not this way because they want to be this way. Something happened. So it's, the, it's all in the approach, you know? And if I can't get through to somebody, I've crossed lines before and gone to family and said, something's going on with that guy and you need to, to figure it out and you need to let me know what I can do to help. There's, you're not crossing lines when it comes to somebody's mental well-being because if you don't say something, you might not ever get the chance to. Yeah. So just be tactful. Don't be like in their face. Just kind of a, approach it from the side. Don't come running right at this guy. Not in public, obviously. Hey, you know, and I've worked with guys before and been like, let's go get a beer after work. And, you know, I don't care if it's seven in the morning, we'll find something and let's sit down and talk about it. And I've done that my whole life. I've always been a counselor, like, you know, mom's in should be on my door of my office, <laughs> but you know, people come and, and, and people know when they share something with me that they're not leaving without a plan. You know, if you come and say, I'm going through a really hard time, you know, okay, well, what are we going to do about it together? If a friend comes to you and said, I'm having a hard time, man, that's your door open. You know, so privacy always works. Um, if it's on the job and it has to happen at that moment, you know, let's take a walk outside. You know, that it's possible. Um, and then sometimes you just can't get through. Sometimes that person just can't find that out. And don't blame yourself. I've been there. I lost a friend of suicide. And, oh, God, I should have called him back. I should have done this. I should have done that. And Nope. I that, did everything. That, that I, person needs help too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There's a level of guilt that comes with that. So, um, you know, it, the one-on-one -on -one is always the best approach, yeah. you know, and then I'm sorry, but crossing the line to the family, if you have to do it, do it. No rules. Nope. Nope. Not when someone's life's in jeopardy. Yeah. Okay. That's our job. <laughs> wow. That's a great way to end it. That is our job. Yeah. Uh, you don't want it, but, but knowing you, Corey, you don't want to end it. Right. <laughs> you still have questions that you have to I, ask. There's <laughs> so many questions. <laughs> so we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> don't you want to ask your usual at the end of the podcast questions? Oh my gosh. I, you know, did you ironically, I, I did. I always forget. I always well, forget. It, that's been like my new station in this podcast <laughs> is to remind it's reminding Corey me of, to oh. ask my one question. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, me and Tracy probably did a couple of these ones together. But um, Chief, any what's the what are some of the best pranks you remember? Oh God! Yeah, did people pull Put you on the spot? Here. Did people pull pranks on on you? It, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I would have. Everyone knows I hate mice. They would be hanging from nooses from my locker. Oh my dead God. ones I in my purse. I don't think that's a joke. That <laughs> no, dead ones in my oh purse. My that was God. the worst. You know, getting flowered in the shower. That was the worst. Mm. And then having a call. But I, my favorite one ever to this day. I used to bake cakes and it was a big deal to me. And one time I came in and someone had put pencils in the whole thing. Station two came to station three. <laughs> in, in your cake? In my cake. And I used to make a cake for station two and station three. And they came when we were on a call and put pencils in it. That was the end of the cakes in Melrose. That's it. That stopped it. No cake for you. So, I mean, just that's the best part of yeah. the job is like razzing each other. And the you, got, humor. You, got, you got flowered in the shower? I got flowered in the shower. Oh but, my but my retaliation on those guys, I, the next morning they all went on a call. I stayed and I disconnected all their car batteries. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. I had that help. Was <laughs> but that was my, that was, that was my like proud of myself moment. 
It's it is amazing the, the guy, amount of work that they put in. <laughs> like you've all gotten the saline under the table where you think you're dribbling. No, no. no which one that? You turn what? the. I, I know we're probably getting too much into this now. No, like I'm this getting is, way this too much. This is what this podcast is all about. You yeah. tape the saline to the nasal cannula, and you put the nasal cannula kind of up at somebody at the okay, table, underneath the table. But then under the table, under your knee, is a saline, and it's taped to that. And every time they take a sip of water, you knee up. And it dribbles. Oh they get this God. dribble, and they keep oh, my glasses mess. So get a new glass. Get, that's my favorite one. That just, that's, that's my favorite dinner table. That's another slow one, though. Again, like the guy is the just planning. confused at the yeah. table. Yeah. Well, yeah. hook up a hook up a syringe. Yep. Just give it a little. Sh- yep. You know, see the guy next to him. Oh God, it's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if if we're gonna, I've been wanting to tell this story, um, but and finally, I'm waiting for somebody from Division Twenty to come in. Uh, if we're talking about like bunk room stuff, so, um, me and uh, he's on the city now and I have no problems whatsoever saying Josh Kowalczyk's name, mm-hmm. but, um, I won't, so, another, great I, guy. I, I, another great guy, right. Uh, you know what? Let's just not say Josh Kowalczyk <laughs> and let's just say it's somebody else. <laughs> that's not Josh Kowalczyk. Uh, but Josh had a terrible, terrible, <laughs> he was, he would sleepwalk and he would like have night terrors. And if the bunk room in Bellwood, you know, we're all together in the same bunk room. And back before they had like the Norcom thing, you had the officer sat or slept in the one bed next to the telephone. And the, the, the calls would actually come through the dispatcher and go right to the telephone, to the speaker. So you could actually hear like people screaming in the background when the officer took the call, like, you know, where are we going? What's wrong? What's going on? And so <laughs> when we, when we switched over, to the new system, the red light would come up on in the um in the bunk room and it would like ramp up the tones. So it was like a soft, it wasn't so abrupt. And it so <laughs> Josh would have these terrors and he would freak me out so bad that I said, Josh, listen, if you're having your night terrors, I'm like, let's work out a plan so that you don't scare the shit out of me every time these tones go off. <laughs> so he's like, all right, man. And I'm like, all right, if you're freaking out, our, our like safe word is going to be antelope. All right. When you hear <laughs> antelope in your night terrors, I'm like, that means that everything's cool. Go back to bed and we'll be fine. And, and like, just keep in mind, this is just one story. I, I, I'll I tell all my Josh Kowalczyk stories throughout the, the course of this podcast, <laughs> but, but this one in particular, since we went into the bunk room uh, on this podcast. So sure enough, later that night, <laughs> the tones go off and he, just gets up and he's screaming at the top of his lungs. He's got no shirt on and he's like completely tired, just screaming at the top of his lungs. And he's right next to me. And I got the covers pulled up of like, and all I could think was antelope, antelope, antelope. And now everybody in the bunk room has no idea that no me and his, right, idea was right. nobody, nobody has been like informed that we have a safe word. You know, they've, they, they're kind of, know that Josh had these terrors, but now they have no idea why Vince is screaming antelope at this guy screaming <laughs> at the top of his lungs. Uh, and so when you were talking about, you know, th- this guy with the sailing that kind of brought that to mind that, uh, that, that happened. And that was just one of many. So you, you know, Josh, right? Yes, yeah, I do. He's one of the greatest guys ever. Actually, I think he was on my list and I was so sad to see him go to the city. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> You missed out on a good yeah, guy. Yeah, oh, I know. You missed out on a good guy. <laughs> um, uh, anything else that you want to talk about? Anything you, like, is there ways that people can help you out? Can any of, you know, you got something that you want to uh, promote that our listeners could, you know, maybe oh, you know help what? out? I, or I got something to ask you real quick about. Did, sure. did we talk at all about the Explorers? I was going to say oh, that. Let's That's do like that. My yeah, pride let's and joy. do it. Let's okay. do it. So the Explorers are my pride and joy. I started that uh, six years ago. And uh, today. Were you an of- Explorer, Cody? You went to the Explorer program, right? Look at it. It's, it's the greatest. Here's a product of an Explorer program. Oh, in, it, all, in all of his glory. <laughs> look at him. <laughs> it's, it, it's these kids who have a passion so early on, you just need to develop it. And, you know, we've, we've seen these kids through EMT school, paramedic school. Um, I just had a test last week and two of my kids took my test. They get five extra points. But the Explorer program 
essentially was part of Boy Scouts of America. Now it is separate because they say Boy Scouts of America might be going away. But explorers, oh, I think I think they've gone away. Not yet. Yeah, we're, they're still we're there. hanging on. Yeah, we're trying to make sure we get explorers separated. First. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, it, we have an excellent program. We take up to twenty kids is pretty much what we can handle right now. Um, we have about seven graduating this year, so we're opening a lot of. Sp- we're always at capacity. This is how great the program is. Uh, We've got, we do everything with them. They meet three times a month. Um, They have their own board meetings where they have to talk about how they're going to raise funds for camp, which they usually go to IFSI camp. They have an explorer camp that's out of this world. I mean, three days of burning for kids. My kids just love it. (laughs) Um, We also do, you know, stuff in our tower. Um, We're actually getting a new parking lot and a burn structure in Broadview. So they're going to get to get into that along with everybody in Division 20. Um, but these kids just have thrived and 80% are either in the military or have a fire job. Um, the other 20% have found a job and some, um, in- insurance, one of them found a job in, and they're, they're kind of, but, but these kids didn't do dumb stuff, you know, during their teen years, they had guidance from us. We pushed them in the direction of where they wanted to go. And I'm just, I'm beyond proud of all of them. Like they're all like my own kids. It was, it was hard because the one kid is interviewing, uh, we had our interviews this week and I went to go hug him. I was like, oh God, don't do that to that child. You're you're not his mother. And I'm a professional. You're the chief and he's going into an interview. Oh my, go away. Well, I didn't know anything about the explorers. I went to the Operation North Pole this year and I saw a bunch of your guys out there. Yeah. They These were, kids love doing that too. Yeah. I need, and that's there the There was thing. a bunch of them. They have to give to get. So they go and sign up for stuff and, and do a lot. And now they're all, they're hooked on Operation North Pole. I mean, that's is that thing. one of the Is that one of the greatest things uh, ever? Amazing. Yeah. But I can't, I mean, I could go into tears with what, you know, they well, do. Well, I mean, I, you, you know, you talk about going into tears. I went in there and I, you know, a friend of mine had been asking me to, to do this and he has been doing it for a while. My buddy, uh, Aaron Ambrosiak. Um, and you know, he like literally from the, from day one, he's been part of this. And for the last couple of years, he's been like, Hey, you know, this is about that calendar Vince, or <laughs> no, oh, no, 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 different, different one. <laughs> and, uh, different project. so I, I, I was like, you know, the, the day's working out, you know, um, this will work out. I'll go over there. And, um, I was not prepared for how I was going to feel when these kids came walking down that line, you know, and mm-hmm. for people who don't know, it's, you know, about, uh, cancer kids and, um, uh, like really sick children that these guys like set, make a day for them where they take them on, they have their own train, they do all these things and they bring gifts. And then you go into the Rosemont where they have this whole thing set up for them. And it's just a special day for them. And they put them up and they take care of these kids. But when these kids walk down and they walk this gauntlet and they're on each side, you know, are from people from different departments and, you know, the requirements that, you know, where you're at least your bunker pants, your suspenders and your helmet. Mm-hmm. And they walk down this gauntlet and they're high fiving you, thanking you. And I, I was sitting there, I was like, okay, this is, you know, a piece of cake. These guys are going to walk down. By the time the first kid walked down, I was practically in tears. Oh yeah. And it's the whole family. And Marvin it goes on, and it goes it on, for, it goes on for an hour. And I was like, I am going to lose it. Yep. yep. <laughs> I'm going to lose it. These, these kids are like happy and they're smiling and they're thanking you. I'm like, you're thanking me, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. look at you guys. This is ridiculous. One of the first years I got involved with that, I offered to take the gifts to the families who couldn't be there because their child was sick. And one of them had lost their child and I had to deliver the gifts because their other children get gifts too. And I had to bring it to the house. You want to talk about like a reality check in your life and how yeah. blessed you are. I mean, uh, Barb and Tim who put this whole Operation North Pole together are saints and they have expanded this. And the fact that we get to be part of it. Yeah, it's one of anybody, the most amazing things I've been a part of. I, any fireman out there, I mean, the hardest days are the setup and the cleanups. Like just do something, be part of it because you, it's rewarding the whole way. Yeah, that, uh, and you know, uh, we're going to do something um, with those guys this year. I mean, it's, that is something amazing, and um, we really should be um, doing a lot more for that for that program. Absolutely, you know, and uh, we'll uh, we'll do something special this year for those guys. So, so the explorers are the explorers 
we put them with that. And now every year, I don't even have to ask. They come to me on one setup day, one gift wrapping day, one's, you know, they, well, they well, ask you had me. a whole contingency there. I thought it was a department because, <laughs> you know, like we all put our stuff, you know, all in, you know, Broadview's here, Hillside's here, Chicago's, you know, and then there was a whole group and I was like, who are these guys? Like, they're they're kind of young, but I mean, you know, who are these they had the most gear over there. I was like, who are these guys? And I was like, what's an explorer? Yeah. You know, they, like they had gear and, you know, stuff. I was like, what's an explorer? I didn't, I didn't know. Well, there's not a lot. Of, I, I, my friend, Jimmy from Niles, he put that one together and that's how I learned about explorers and found out about them, what they do. And I kind of based mine off of his and it's just been growing. I mean, in every, like I said, kids who may not have had opportunities um, truly have, and we guide them through the whole thing. And, and it's just a, like, putting them through like some fire service oriented stuff and uh, just getting them exposed to that. And it, in hopes that they want to go down this hopes that they come work for me. I mean, yeah. it, I'll be honest with you. The reason why it started was the mayor back then had said to our chief, we don't reflect our community at all. There's only white guys here. Now, what are you going to, how are you going to change that? And then it was brought to me and I said, well, do something within the community. Duh. You know, bring the community in. And another guy who was supposed to start the program, he actually got all the information for me and, and put it in my lap. And I was like, oh, I'm totally doing this. And just invited kids in from the neighborhood and, you know, they got interested. And again, who knows how different their lives would be if they didn't have this. But it's nice to know that we had a hand in promoting such an awesome job. And then I truly hope someday they go take the test and they come by me. How can and, uh, people get involved in that program? So Pat McGivney is, is in the name of the guy that's in charge of it at Broadview Fire Department. And all you have to do is call the fire department, um, 708-343-6124. Uh, just hit nine and ask for the Explorer program and they'll connect you to it. If he's not there, it goes to his voicemail and he calls kids right back. Um, just make sure that when the kids do call, um, that parents are available because we won't just talk to the kids. We need right. to talk to the parents. Um, we take kids ages 14 to 21. Like I said, I've got uh, seven 21 year olds this year that are graduating. So, um, and moving on and doing great things. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Well, Any limitations to who you'll take in? Chief, or? No, okay. no, no. And uh, again, um, we will make sure that it, we've had questions about bringing in um, some kids on the spectrum of autism. And would we do that? You bet. I'll modify things. I'll make things happen. You know, even... My thing is, is if I have to be there and do something to make things happen, I will. It's like there's no barriers for us, right. you know? Right. These kids are willing to come out and, and do something with us. Why? Who are we yes. to tell them they can? Exactly. Yeah, let them have the experience. Yep. You know, yeah. let, let them go through it. Let them do something different. Yep. You know, that's what it's all about, right? Yep. Well, um, any last words, Chief? Any last words, Corey? I, you know what? I, uh, I'm you're, a, you're, I'm you're at a loss this. for words? Yeah. No, you know what? It, it's phenomenal. And then... I know I said on, on social media, like I've got two little girls and, and honestly, chief, I can't think of a better hero for them to look up to oh, than you. So nice. As, uh, again, for someone who's just always just had such a positive attitude and just, you know, after, after the layoff, just coming back and you know what, a lot of people would have a terrible attitude. You come back, you just marched your way all the way up to the top and just got stuff done. So thank you. For Thank everything you. Too. Thank <laughs> you. You're one of those guys that, that, that made it easy. You know, it's having good guys in the fire service that made this job great for me. So thank you for having me. This was awesome. I'm well, glad I was able to put the word out about some things. Oh, it's, it's been our honor to have yeah. you here. Thank you so much for making the time for us. And, uh, Let's have another glass of whiskey. Let's have, huh? let's have a drink. Let's it's have like, a drink. It's like the 1980s Broadview Tower in here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that should wrap it up uh, for this episode of Chicago's Bravest Stories. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. This has been a Fire and Iron Media production. You have something to say, people want to listen. How is that, Daddy? The opinions and views are that of Chicago's Bravest Stories and their guests. They do not necessarily reflect the views of any municipal governments, fire protection districts, fire departments, EMS, or law enforcement organizations.